Hey, this is Beth Wilson, Pulaski County Horticulture Agent, and I'm going to do a quick uh, slide set on growing tomatoes in the home garden. Um, I do want you to be aware that you can uh, contact me or see my uh, social media posts at the following things on Facebook at Pulaski County Horticulture, on Twitter at Hort Agent Beth, and on Instagram at KY Plants. First of all, before we get started, uh, we're not going to go into all the prep and everything for the garden, uh, but you, we wanna, we're going to assume that you have a good garden spot in mind, which means full sun for tomatoes, and you've taken a soil test, and you'll adjust all those nutrients according to what uh, the recommendations called for in that soil test. So what are we going to plant these things? I'm going to run through <clears throat> a number of uh, pictures that just kind of show you how different people have have uh, planted tomatoes and how they've managed them. In this case, you can see that they're planted in the ground on slightly raised ridges. Um, there's a drip irrigation tube there, and they have posts with uh, uh, twine dangling down to keep them off the ground. Uh, no weeds in the middle. This is a very well-managed planting. This, this person must really love their tomatoes. And then this is more typical of a backyard. Um, this again is in a raised bed um, and uh, they've got the wire cages around it. It's very important to have uh, some method of keeping the plant off the ground because that's where all our diseases start. Uh, so raised beds are good, warms the soil up uh, a little bit more, that plant really takes off. And then here's a homemade uh, black plastic. Uh, commercial growers use black plastic all the time, but you can do it on your own just like this fella has. Um, he's also put in a very good rigid system to keep those plants uh, off the ground. He's got, you know, very good stakes and uh, wire there. Um, he's going to keep his plants from, from dropping to the ground, no, no doubt about it. And we can plant tomatoes in containers. Uh, we're talking usually about, you know, five gallon bucket type of volume. Um, we do need some depth to the container simply because tomato roots are gonna be, gonna need that room. <clears throat> as far as the soil mix, we do wanna stay away from garden soil due to some of the uh, uh, diseases that may come as part of that soil. So if you wanna make your own mix, you can, you can do that or you can just use some bag stuff. Um, if you do the soil mix, you want to do a one-to-one-to-one to, one to, one to uh, compost to core to perlite. And then once you put that thing, that tomato plant, in a container, it is up to you to provide all the nutrients. So you have to have a fertilizer that's going to have all the nutrients in it. Um, and you also need to make sure that you're getting uh, calcium and magnesium to those plants. Calcium you know, you could throw a handful of lime in that in that soil mix and mix it throughout the, the container. For magnesium, we're talking about Epsom salts. Uh, so just keep that in mind. You are in charge of everything that plant's going to be getting. And if, if you do go the container route, there are some um, All-America selections that have been uh, selected for, for containers, and uh, those are listed there. Um, they're going to be these cherry tomatoes, not, not a slicer tomato, but um, these can be very attractive even in a hanging basket. So um, just a few to take a look at. People grow these things in bags. I've seen it done. Um, obviously, you're going to have to have some support system, um, but this is possible. Again, you're going to be in charge of some of those micronutrients like the uh, calcium and the magnesium that these uh, plants might need. So you're in charge. And a five gallon buckets there on the right work, work great. The main thing is all your containers need to have holes in the bottom. You need to drill holes in the bottom. Um, if you use one of these grow bags on the left, um, they're very porous, they'll, they'll do fine. Um, but the main thing, I, I like this and I don't like this uh, black grow bag. If you're putting this on the west side of your house where it's going to get that hot western sun, I can about guarantee you that black bag is going to cook some roots. So if you do use a black bag, which works well because it does warm up and tomatoes do like, you know, warm roots, um, you may put that on the eastern side of your house where it's getting that more moderate sun 
and then uh, and you'll still have enough sun to, to produce quite a bit of tomatoes. And the other thing to take a look at on these pictures is they still have support systems in there. Um, you've got to keep these plants off the ground so air can move through those leaves and through the fruit to dry everything off. And just another picture of a, a half of a whiskey barrel. Look fine. And then um, again, we're talking about just different containers. So you can put, use one of these watering troughs. Again, you want holes in the bottom, so it's no longer going to hold water. So, um, uh, but you can grow a number of them as, long, as far as they're, as long as they're spaced out correctly. And people love their gardens. They'll do it anywhere, even on top of their car. I thought this was hilarious. All right, so when are we gonna plant? Uh, we're gonna plant our seeds. If we're gonna grow our own transplant, we wanna back up and, and start those seeds about seven or eight weeks prior to getting them outside. And our last chance of frost is usually that first week of May, although you can you know, adjust that. In the last part of April, you can take a look at the long-term forecast and see what they're saying about frost. Um, if you do plant a few out and we get a frost, you can still protect those young plants probably. Um, but I know my grandmother always planted her tomatoes on May the 10th, and she was from Eastern Kentucky, and that's just when she planted them. Um, the last day to plant them, as far as getting a fall crop, would be around the middle of July. And um, sometimes you'll want to stagger your planting so you, you're not using the same plants you planted in May to be your harvest in in. Uh, August because there's so many disease problems that can happen. I would I would kind of try to have at least two or three plantings even in the home garden just so your plants are fresh and you're not having to take that really old plant through a lot of diseases. And the spacing is going to really depend on the type of tomato you choose whether it be determinate or an indeterminate. Um, and, you know, if you've got an indeterminate plant, they're going to get huge, and so you really need to give them space. Um, so I would definitely go with, uh, with more than 24 inches, maybe between plants, maybe, uh, maybe even up to, to a yardstick. Um, on determinants, 18 to 24 inches is usually pretty good. And um, if you're going to use a square foot garden, uh, some of these real compact varieties, um, you can plant one plant per square foot, but honestly, to me, that real estate is so important in a square foot garden. I wouldn't grow a tomato, especially not an indeterminate tomato, uh, simply because it's going to take up way too much space. And there's a lot of other things you could use that that small amount of space uh, for. Um, maybe the compact, compact or determinate plants you get away with in a square foot garden. Just understand that to me, that's high value real estate. And so if you've got a garden area that where you can plant a bunch of tomatoes in a row or um, something like that. I would use that space for that and come and do your lettuces and radishes and things like that. Um, uh, even broccoli, cauliflower, those type of things. Um, even peppers in a square foot garden. They don't take up near as much space. So here's a picture of one of these square foot gardens. This one is, happens to be at the Pulaski County Library Children's Garden. And you can see the tomato in the front. Um, it's very small, very compact, already has a couple tomatoes on it. Um, but you've got all, to me again, I think this is a better use of some of the, um, the real estate here in this square foot garden. You've got a pepper, you've got some onions, you've got lettuces, things like that, that don't require as much space and yet you can manage it a little bit better. So how much should we plant? Um, our uh, ID128 uh, is our uh, UK home vegetable guide, and in it, it's got tables that go over this. So to eat fresh, we're talking about three to five plants per person. If you want to preserve it, you need to double that. Um, and if you're into canning, you, def you may want to have more than that. You may want to have staggered planting so you have a little bit all the time and can kind of, kind of uh, not overwhelm yourself with trying to get things done. Varieties. Everybody has their their favorite variety. They will not ever change. But I just wanted to let you know of some some varieties you may want to consider because um, uh, they're always coming up with new varieties. But I understand people do like what they like, and um, it's hard to change sometimes. 
Um, first of all, let's just talk about heirloom versus hybrid. And heirloom just means it's an, it's an open pollinated plant. It means if you save the seed from that plant, you're going to get basically this exact same plant back from that seed. And so that makes it easy to save seeds. You're not having to rely on buying your seed every year. Um, a hybrid is also, a lot of times there'll be an F1 beside of it in the catalogs. That just means it's got two specific parents uh, that they bred together. And the, the seed that you get from that plant more than likely will not come back true to that the plant you, you uh, save the, the seed off of. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that people tend to think that hybrid plants are evil and they're they're not. I just mean we've been breeding tomatoes since since we learned about tomatoes when, since we discovered tomatoes. So man has been breeding these things all along. Sometimes they come back true to seed, sometimes they don't. But we're trying to do, these breeders are trying to get disease resistance into these plants, which is a major deal. We've got several diseases that hit and can hit hard. Um, and that means that you won't have to spray. So um, don't just discount hybrids altogether. Uh, give one or two a shot every once in a while. And just so you, this isn't a bunch of hooey, um, the UK, UK did a taste test panel back in 2008 and they had 111 people taste tomatoes and they ranked and there was a it was a combination of uh, hybrids and heirlooms the x means it's a it's a hybrid the h means it's an heirloom and what you know they just said what tastes the best and the one that came to the top was actually a hybrid named mountain magic and you can see the brandy wine and mr ugly um and the court the the ox heart also came in there high, but again, there's a lot of X's on this thing. Number five there, BHN. Uh, number seven is Amelia, a hybrid, which a lot of commercial growers grow. And uh, just so you know, Mountain Magic is a one that a lot of commercial growers grow. Um, the difference between the commercial growers growing this and you as a backyard gardener growing this is that you can you can take this all the take that tomato all the way to to red ripe and then harvest it, bring it in your kitchen and eat it. These guys that are going commercially generally cannot do that due to packing and having to travel and, and the bruising that would occur. So these are really good varieties if you can ripen them up on the vine. And just another taste test panel that they had in Boone County uh, in 2013 and 14. Again, we had some heirlooms and, and hybrids both come um, to the top. So grandma is a, is a hybrid, great white is an heirloom. Um, but number three, they had a basically a tie among a, a bunch of these. Um, and the 2013 one on the bottom, every one of them that they they uh, they ranked was a hybrid that came in first, second, and third. So again, just just to show you that it's, hybrids aren't all bad if you can ripen them up. Plum Dandy is one a good one from uh, NC State Breeding Program. I think it's 82 days. So if you need a plum tomato to can, uh, this would be a, a really good one to start with. It's got a lot of disease resistance, so I would certainly consider it. Cherokee purple is another uh, heirloom type that a lot of people like. It is indeterminate, 72 days, um, pretty pretty large tomato. Uh, a lot of people like this one, so uh, it's... It, and it does taste good according to the uh, taste test. Then there's early Goliath. It's a slicer type. Um, if you like early girl, um, you, you may want to try this. This one's a heavier yielder. Um, it's got a really good disease resistance package with it and it's, uh, it's a 58 day. And then big beef. Uh, boy, it's an old one, but it's a good one. It's an indeterminate. It was an AAS winner, an All-America Selections winner, a long time ago. It's still on the market, still, still a good one to try. And then Mr. Stripey, of course, is a pretty popular one. It's, it's a red and yellow mix. It's, it's a large tomato, 12 ounces or so. It has these ridged shoulders, and a lot of people like it because it has, uh, it's lower in acid. Now, some of the new ones that have come down the, the breeding pike, as they say, it, one named Defiant. Um, this was bred by Johnny Seed several years ago, and um, 
It has very high resistance to late blight and intermediate resistance to early blight. And uh, early blight is the one that really, really devastates uh, home garden tomatoes. Uh, this is a determinate type. It's 70 days. It's something you may want to try. Another one that's been bred, and these have all been bred conventionally, not using gene guns or anything like that. Uh, no, no GMOs here. Um, this is just traditional breeding, the Defiant and Iron Lady. Um, Iron Lady was uh, bred uh, in collaboration, a collaboration between Cornell and NC State. It has, has the triple resistance. It's got resistance to late blight, early blight, and septoria. Um, these if they, if they are true to what they say, these should be excellent tomatoes. Now, if they taste like crap, then they're not any good, but um, at least it's got the disease resistance in there. It also has some resistance to the wilts. Um, it's a bushy determinant uh, tomato that's about 75 days. All right, so let's talk a little bit about watering. Watering is extremely important for tomatoes. Uh, as that plant gets really, really big um, and, and it has all those tomatoes set on the, on the vine, um, it's using a lot of water to fill those fruit. It's losing a lot of water with all those leaves when it's 95 degrees outside. So we really do need to water um, these tomato plants. We cannot rely on Mother Nature. Um, the critical periods, of course, are going to be during establishment, which makes sense. Um, and then as those roots enlarge, uh, which would be almost any other time, <laughs> and then any time when there's fruits on the plant. So you're going to be watering these things. Um, be, be ready to water every day once the fruits um, start hanging on those vines. And as far as fertilization, you know, once you've done the, the main stuff about just bringing the, your P and K levels up, your phosphorus and potassium levels up, and getting your pH right, um, we do want to side dress. And we want to be sure that we're pushing these plants along with a little bit of nitrogen all season long. So we're talking about, you know, uh, in our ID-128, it, it has the exact amounts of uh, what to put down and when to put them down. And it calls for five tablespoons of ammonium nitrate per 10 foot of row. And you want to apply that uh, before the first picking and then after the first picking. But I would do it about every two weeks while you're, while you're harvesting. Um, Organic growers generally, generally rely on compost and organic fertilizers, and those aren't going to be immediately available like uh, ammonium nitrate or 2700 would be. Um, so it's going to be a little bit different, but if you're using compost, that's going to be a slow feed all season long. And if you have any questions, um, be happy to answer them. I'll do another uh, uh, slide presentation on just some of the problems tomatoes have and how to... to um, resolve them. So be looking for that. Uh, but you can email me anytime. Uh, um, it's just my name, beth.wilson at uky.edu. It can be all lowercase. It doesn't matter. Um, you can certainly message me on Facebook. Um, the, web, the, the Facebook site is uh, Pulaski County Horticulture. So I wish you the best of luck in growing tomatoes this year.